Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for the opening night reception briefing on accelerating green growth in ASEAN here at the Bloomberg Sustainable Business Summit in Singapore. I'm Ishika Mukherjee, Bloomberg's Asia ESG and Climate Reporter. I'm delighted to have all of you here today and I look forward to all the discussions that are to come over the next 24 hours. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our summit advisors, Bangkok Bank and Fraser's Property Limited for making this session possible. Um, now let's get started. Uh, today, we're kicking things off with a panel that I'll be moderating on advancing sustainable growth in Southeast Asia. Please join me in welcoming to the stage my panelists. Uh, we have Chao Wong Yun, Chief Sustainability Officer for United Overseas Bank in Thailand, and Megan Willis, and Megan Willis, Head of Sustainable Sourcing for Livelihoods and Nature at Unilever. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having us. I think let's kick things off with a very broad question. What's the biggest business challenge that you're focusing on for the second half of this year? What's keeping you up at night? Wong Yun, if you want to go first. Uh, I would say regulations. Right. <laughs> so uh, okay. So I'm. I'm. Maybe I'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Mung Yuan. I'm a Singaporean based in Thailand over the last five years. Um, I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for UOB Thailand. Uh, and and like all CSOs, my job is to develop, implement, execute sustainability strategies for the bank. Right. So Thailand is actually right now at a very very exciting time because I think one of the key things we can all agree is that. If um, the one of the key hindrance it, uh, to reaching your national climate goals, it's fragmented policies, right? And Thailand right now, it's coming up with the Climate Change Act and likely to be out next year. And one of the most exciting parts of the Climate Change Act is the potential hybrid scheme of the emission trading scheme plus the carbon tax. So I think recently there's been quite a bit of news on the carbon tax uh, in the market. And unlike Singapore's carbon tax, our Thai carbon tax right now, it's actually going to be part of the excise tax. And it's only starting from the petrol uh, and oil and gas products first. So net-net, there's no um, impact to the end consumers. But the critical thing, it's, it's signaling to the market right now that, look, the Thai government is now going to start classifying uh, carbon, uh, putting a price on carbon, and then this will actually shape the market a bit more. And what it means is ultimately, right now at this moment, most of the decarbonization cost is actually borne by the corporates that are trying to do good. With the carbon tax and the uh, ETS scheme, companies of all sizes will start looking at decarbonization at the same time. And it's actually equally split up uh, across the value chain. So I think that's something that's actually keeping me excited and then working on the strategies around it. Very interesting. What mm. about you, Megan? Yeah, I'll give first an introduction as well mm. to myself. So I'm Megan Willis. Um, I do lead the livelihoods uh, thematic for smallholder farmers for Unilever. But in addition, I do have a crop portfolio where we also look at our nature-based goals as well, um, responsible for delivering on those. So it's very important to understand I sit very much on the implementation side of things, which I think is a slightly different perspective than we sometimes see, you know, at a conference like like yours. Um, and so, you know, first I would say when you enter the first half of the year, you're celebrating a lot of success, right? Which is something Unilever has a lot of, right, in, in sustainability. 15 years of success in, you know, reducing our GHG emissions, achieving that no deforestation goal that we set for ourselves for 2023. Um, you know, helping retailers around the world uh, to improve their livelihoods, you know, having a leading living wage goal in the industry. But as you look forward, of course, as we tend to do in the second half of the year, I, you know, I would agree that, that regulation is, is top of mind. Um, as a Europe-based company, of course, we, we are excited by and, and challenged by the upcoming EU deforestation regulations. So that's something that's very much top of mind for us, um, as well as, you know, planning across our, our new sustainability commitments across the board. Okay, you've both cannibalized my second question. It's <laughs> going to be on the key regulatory development you're watching. So let's go to you, Wang Yun. Um, so transition finance is crucial. Um, yeah. UOB's chief sustainability officer yeah. has recently said. Um, Yet UOB has said that it will stop lending to oil and gas projects that were approved for development since 2022. Yeah. It's trying to exit the thermal coal 
um, yeah. financing. Yeah. Um, and with all this in mind, transition finance is so important to this region. Yes. Are these policies being reviewed at UOB right now? Uh, okay, so we are always reviewing our policies to ensure it stays relevant to the market, right? Uh, that broad base um, policy of exiting thermal coal by 2039, no more upstream oil and gas financing uh, to 20, uh, from since 2022, mm -hmm. that will definitely stay. But what will change is the, the thresholds uh, within the lending limits within each sector, we will start looking at, at um, start uh, exiting that portfolio as time go by. But I think what is very critical to understand is that transition finance, it's actually a partnership with the fossil fuel uh, players, right? Clients who are committed towards a net zero target, oil and gas players, uh, even metals and mining players, the high emitting sectors, those that are committed to going towards that direction, we will work with them to provide transition finance. For Thailand especially, our coal portfolio is actually, or rather the coal uh, in our energy mix is actually about 15% only. But we are actually gas locked in for the next two decades. And why is that? The government has actually uh, started a, or rather approved LNG, new LNG terminals. Uh, and we have also approved new uh, gas fired power plants. So over the, over the next two decades, we will likely have to learn to live with fossil gas. But we will want to help uh, fossil generation players to be more efficient in their energy usage, uh, develop more byproducts like uh, co-generation of heat as well. So I think those are the areas we are definitely looking at in, in terms of working together with our, our clients and, and um, putting out the transition finance out there. Could I get you to tell us a bit more about the change to lending limits? <laughs> so definitely as time goes by, right? Yeah. When, when your portfolio of, um, or rather when your clients are decarbonizing, naturally your loan portfolio will get smaller as well, or rather your finance emissions will get smaller as well. So as time goes by, we will relook at the whole portfolio and identify which part of the, which part of the portfolio we should start shrinking a little bit more so, as we, so, so that we can reach our own net zero targets as well. Mm. You and I have discussed scope three emissions before. Yes. Um, it's the biggest emissions for a bank, right? Yeah. Scope three. So what are what's the progress towards targets and how is your beast Thailand unit helping the bank achieve these? Yeah. Okay, so for scope our scope three is about seven hundred times more than our scope one and two emissions combined together, right? So, uh, and like with every sector, scope three is the hardest to decarbonize. So for the bank, we don't look at say scope three in particular from, uh, from this sector, it's a scope one and scope two combination and things like that, no. We look at our clients in totality. And for us in Thailand, because Thailand is one of the key markets for UOB group, what we did was we take the, the, the country's opportunities and our UOB sector focuses, marry them together, and identify the next, uh, the near-term opportunities and the commonalities. And the critical industry and the critical sectors that we are looking at is actually across the board, everything relating to energy efficiency, anything relating to electrification, and anything relating to renewable on-site installation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Megan, let's come to you. Um, you mentioned the EU deforestation regulation. Yep. Um, okay, I hope I get this right. But Unilever has said that 97.5% of its supply chain is deforestation free for palm oil, paper and board, tea, soy and cocoa. You got it. Yes. Okay, the order <laughs> volumes, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a lot. It's a lot. How, are you, how have you achieved that and how are you verifying it? Yeah, so this has been a lot of work. This effort really cannot be underestimated by our teams and really by everybody in our supply chain. So we wrote several years ago protocols that were unique to each of these crops um, because they do have different standards. They are in different you know, geographies. And it's a, it's a tiered set of standards. So the first is really the negligible risk set. Um, these are from countries where deforestation is really less of a risk that is verified by a third party. A third party, of course, helped us to write all of these protocols. Then we rely on agriculture certification systems that we feel also you know, address the deforestation issue in a way that, that meets our standards. But then over and above that, we do have separate bespoke 
protocols that we've written with with partners that you know take you know GPS points, polygon maps. It's a lot of geospatial analysis to understand what's really happening in our supply chain. We do have that traceability down to the farm level, mm -hmm. so that we can analyze what's really going on. Uh, we do personally verify that in-house with our teams. My specialist is actually here tonight, if anybody would really like to learn about that. Um, and we can then put that whole system through, calculate, and then that gets verified on top by, by PwC. Okay, so is this compliant with EU deforestation? Regime? It's very similar. Um, so when we were writing the protocol, we were ahead of EUDR. And I think a lot of people involved in the writing were also in a lot of consultations with the European Commission. So we had a sense of what direction that was going to go. And I think you know we might speak later in this panel about fragmented regulations. You don't necessarily aim to have you know, a very, very bespoke one. You need to keep it aligned in your supply chain. Um, so we, we did the best we could. But of course, as EUDR has come out, there are some, some minor differences. Um, they tend to be in the very, very fine details. Um, both are extremely rigorous standards. Mm -hmm. Both are aiming to achieve the same thing. Um, so we, we look at how do we leverage what people are already doing for EUDR. And of course, our suppliers feel that they already have a leg up on EUDR because of everything that they've already had to do for Unilever. Um, so you work with smallholder farmers in Asia and mm -hmm. Africa. Yep. Uh, how prepared are they for EUDR, which is going to be implemented from December? This yeah. Year? So, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, just like a follow-up question. Um, do you think they should be uh, delaying the, the implementation mm. of the policy at this point, or do you feel like Unilever is ready, ready to go? I think from a company perspective, yeah. I, I think most companies are have seen it coming, yeah. are ready to go. It's a matter of making sure maybe your suppliers or some smaller companies who don't have the same level of resources are ready. Whether or not the EU is ready, of course, I can't I can't comment on that. Um, but from the smallholder perspective, I think it's important to understand what is their view. And you know, a smallholder farmer typically has one to two hectares. You know, here in the region, they're growing palm, coconut tea, coffee, something like that, um, they drop off their produce to the trader up the road, whom they have a very close relationship with. That's it, right? That's, that's essentially the end of, of their day, right? So regulations like EUDR might not mean a lot to them. But what they will know is everything that they've been taught, particularly if they're in a certification system or if they've been part of Unilever's journey, um, they know what deforestation means. They know what is and what is not allowed. It's not always cutting down trees. Uh, for example, in cocoa, it's actually growing in protected forest is part of the definition of deforestation. So for them, readiness is probably something they've already done in, in their journey mm -hmm. as a smallholder farmer, being included in major global supply chains that have been looking at this topic for quite a while. They already know what to do. The onus is more on everybody in between. OK. Um, I want to come to topics that are a bit controversial at this stage. Um, so for UOB, uh, I noticed that mm -hmm. there's, you know, you're using renewable energy certificates, carbon offsets mm -hmm. when you're reporting reduced emissions. Yeah. Um, while that's, that's totally standard practice, um, it doesn't physically alter the emissions Correct. directly related to your firm, right? Um, is there a plan to phase out usage? And how is a Thailand, again, Thailand unit hoping to, to help the company achieve that? So renewable energy certificates and carbon offsets are typically used to offset our scope one and two emissions, right? So uh, while it is the smallest part of our overall emissions, it is still quite sizable. So what we have been doing over the past four or five years is to really explore ways to reduce, reduce our emissions first before we start looking at RECs and, and, and carbon offsets. So over the past five years, actually what we did was we for every new building that we are ret retrofitting, that we are building up, everything has to be BCA, platinum, and, or, or even better, mm -hmm. right? And with, with our three bu two buildings right now, it's BCA, platinum. The next one that we are, we are retrofitting right now, it's also reaching to the platinum standard. Uh, for UOB Thailand, we have about 150 branches. Of these branches, there's about a third that's standalone branches. Of these branches, we are actually looking at everything relating to energy efficiency. 
and that includes the security guard leaving the door open, right? So it's all, whenever we are looking at retrofit, whenever there's a retrofitting time, we will look at insulation, we will look at everything that can help reduce um, an energy, and also on the waste side as well. And our whole corporate fleet is going through a EV reflecting program. We are also installing solar rooftop and, and all, all, all that stuff for our branches. So on our own operations, we are trying to at least show that we walk the talk so that when we go to our clients and talk about decarbonization, they can say, okay, we are also doing our, 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 our part, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we are we are definitely carbon neutral, right? Since right. 2021, with the mm. purchase of RECs and, and, and um, carbon carbon uh, offsets. Mm. Uh, the idea is we, we, we are looking at a 2030 roadmap. We still haven't developed the actual target, but the idea is to increase at least energy efficiency reductions uh, by a sizable amount. Over the past five years, we have already achieved 30%. And I think it's a, a, a rather good uh, progress, but we def we feel that we definitely can do more. And the challenge actually comes when we actually grew our assets, right? So we ac we recently purchased the city retail business in Thailand. So that actually grew our assets quite sizable. And to actually get that efficiency back down to the same level as we had, it's also going to take some time. So it's it's not as straightforward, but it's a it's a goal that we are all working on towards. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, Megan, coming to you. So Unilever as we discussed, is the poster child for ESG, yep. right? Um, the, the benchmark in terms of what businesses should be doing. Uh, recently, there's been a change to, mm -hmm. to its targets, its sustainability policies, um, which there have been some questions around. Yep. Uh, could you walk us through, and, and some examples are to, you know, using are include using plastics or how you're working with communities, etc. So, yeah, could you walk us through why it was necessary to change the targets at this point and what it means for your daily work? How have your goalposts shifted, really? Yeah, so I would say, first and foremost, the, the targets haven't necessarily changed. And if anything, it's really a double down on the goals and a real focus on what it is we actually need to do. The evolution of this has come about because when corporate sustainability really became a thing, let's say, 15 years ago, you know, it was really necessary to, to catalyze the corporate sector to even think about these topics. So it was important to set really ambitious, some might say audacious, moonshot goals of these are the big topics. Yeah. These are the things we need to take some responsibility for. And then you would see an evolution into really integrating that into business. So in the case of Unilever, this, you would see our last five years of really getting brands to take this on board, to kind of deliver that to the consumers. You have Dove campaigns, you have Magnum campaigns that now focus on forest or on um, women's empowerment in, in cocoa communities, for example. This really brings to you know, the consciousness of consumers that these are actually things we need to care about as well. And you saw the entire really business of Unilever adopting and understanding that this is something that they need to, to take on board. And what you're seeing now is really an age of accountability. It's no longer enough to say, well, gosh, this is what we hope to do. This is what we really, in our heart of hearts, feel is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So partly because of financial regulations or non-financial reporting, government regulations, it's now, no, really, what are you doing? And what does that look like? And so you have to really focus, bring that down. You see some shorter timeframes um, in our goals, which you know, really do help us to focus and deliver on a shorter timeframe. But what needs to be delivered in those timeframes is still really quite ambitious. And it really pushes us on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, well done. You're both off the hook now. <laughs> that was an easy one. Um, we talked about fragmented regulations. Um, what what for you as a chief sustainability officer, how are you keeping on top of all the regulatory developments that are taking place? Yeah. And how are you dealing with it? Okay, so I mentioned earlier on the Climate Change Act, the Common Tax, and at the same time, there are other developments in other areas, right? So I, I put aside the sector-specific ones first, but uh, there's a taxonomy that, that Thailand actually developed. Uh, phase one last year was completed that covers energy and transportation. That's about 70% of the emissions already. And then uh, uh, phase two will be completed next year, which covers agriculture, manufacturing, the built environment, and whichever that's remaining, um, 30%, right? Uh, taxonomy, it's all good. It gives you the real economy a, a reference tool 
to see which activities are eligible and there's a sunset date and which, consider, which will be considered a transition activity. But what will be very interesting is how this taxonomy is being used by the real economy. Right? So if the intergovernmental ministries decide in 2025 or 2026 that every company needs to report and align your activities according to the te taxonomy, and it is incorporated in the Climate Change Act, if it is incorporated in the Climate Change Act, that will be impactful. So where, where, why I'm saying all this is that we are looking at the impacts from, from the various ministries, from the various governments, and their policies, and from a, totality, from a total perspective, where are the risks, where are the opportunities? And, and I think we, we have to remember that Thailand is a developing economy, and it's just starting out, right? If you look at the GDP per capita of Singapore, say, over the last 30 years, it's been like this, right? Um, same as US, same as uh, uh, Euro, right? But how about the emissions per capita? It's this way. So it's been decoupling for the last 30 years. If you look at Thailand, M Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, for the matter, it's even higher GDP growth, right? But the emissions per capita has been shooting up as well. So it's going in the same tangent. But for Thailand, it, since 2020, 2020, it's been tapering off. So we are really at the start of that decoupling. Mm -hmm. And these regulations will help accelerate. The sector targets, the sector incentives, and all that will also help accelerate the, the adoption of uh, low carbon technologies in time. So what about you, Megan? How are you keeping on top of everything? <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky to be on the implementation side, so I'm a little bit protected from it when it comes to the reporting. Um, but yeah, I do take my guidance from regulations um, and where they're harmonized, it's best. I find it quite challenging when local regulations might differ a bit from um, more international regulations. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the real work of that to, to sort that out often is went through our partnerships. So we, of course, collaborate in, in all of the work that we do. Um, and, and that's really where you see the, the action. Who are your partners? Yeah, okay. so we'll, we'll partner, you know, it, it takes a village, literally. Um, but we, our partnerships are often with um, governments. We do public-private partnerships, NGOs, um, particularly in my world where I work a lot with farmers and rural communities. You need local organizations that are there, that speak the language, that know the culture. Mm -hmm. So we do really rely on them for that face-to-face that -face delivery. Um, we will have financial sector partners as well. So it's, it's really quite the range of stakeholders that, that gets it done. Okay, so no, if, if, I, if I may yeah. add a little bit on partnerships, yeah. right? So I, I know we talked a little bit on fragmented suppliers and all that. So recently, UOB Thailand actually did a CSO roundtable and with CSOs from the large corporates. And we got, got together to discuss the challenges and solutions and things like that. And the key challenge that we faced was actually fragmented suppliers, right? And how to get them to actually start looking at uh, decarbonizing, um, uh, decarbonization seriously. And the good thing of such a roundtable actually that is, was the sharing of you know, what actually worked, what actually did not work, and things like that. And, and a few interesting things came up. Partnerships, right? But partnerships with suppliers, with the critical suppliers, and, and say a, a, a higher learning institute to develop that critical skills for that critical suppliers mm -hmm. and, and, and to actually train that, right? And, we, and a lot of times, actually, what the large companies are trying to do is to build up the small, um, um, small, smaller suppliers' green skills so to level out the playing field as well. Otherwise, it's monopolized by a few critical suppliers and things like that. So there are a lot of commercial benefits in partnerships. So yeah. I think that that's something that we should all seriously consider. Even the banks are also considering partnerships with tech, tech players and, and things like that to actually expand our portfolio too. And Unilever has a great example of this with our supplier climate program. You know, it's not good enough anymore to just say, do it because we said so. Yeah. It's a collaborative experience with 300 of our top suppliers where we're actually you know, helping them along the journey, um, helping to train and, and invest where needed. Um, and so it's a great example yeah. of, of what you just mentioned. Okay, partnerships is key. I'm mindful we're running out of time. <laughs> so uh, just as a last question, uh, what's the biggest business opportunity right now in sustainable finance, according to you? <laughs> sustainable finance. Where uh, is UOB going to grow? 
<laughs> okay, so again, we're looking from a macro. We are looking from a macro perspective, right? Uh, I would say energy efficiency because that is that applies to every every sector across uh, uh, across the board, and there are incentives as well, particularly in the building space. I think naturally, when you look at uh, um, a, a country's decarbonization opportunities, typically building starts first. But in Thailand's case, it's a bit um, tricky. It, it, it was it started with EVs, and then you know the EV policies were, were pretty pretty good, pretty big, and then right now buildings are actually starting out, right? So the the building uh, uh, efficiency codes uh, uh, are a lot more transparent in what they want to achieve right now, and there are local uh, green building certificates that they are pushing as well. So I think the building space is going to be very interesting in the next couple of years, particularly for the retrofitting. Right. Okay, Megan, what about you? What's the most exciting development, uh, be it technological, regulatory, that's coming up as an opportunity for you? I'm going to repeat what I already said. It's the partnerships, it's the collaboration. The age of going it alone as a company is, is quickly passing, competing over sustainability. You know, we're all in this together. Global supply chains are complex, involve a lot of stakeholders. Um, you know, we need participation of governments. We, we really do all have to work together as an industry, and that's really what you're seeing now, and it's very exciting. Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we have now, but thank you very much for joining me. Please join me in applause for Kuo <laughs> Miren and Megan Willis for joining us today.